Hello and welcome to your number one tech show. This is Take on Tech. And today's topic, we are talking about digital accessibilities for people with disabilities. And we want you to chime into this conversation. Remember, the hashtag is Take on Tech at KBC Channel One. Meanwhile, invite a friend to invite a friend. Tell them that Take on Tech has begun. My name is Stephanie Ayeta. <music> The question of the day today comes from the topic of discussion. We are asking you what can be done to increase digital accessibility for people with disabilities. What more needs to be done? The hashtag is Take on Tech at KBC Channel One. <music> In tech news, the Kenyan judiciary has officially launched the first ever digital sex offenders registry in the country. And internationally, the United Arab Emirates is heavily investing in drones with the hope that it could replace oil revenues. We have more details into these two stories in our tech news roundup. Kenyan Judiciary has launched a digital sex offenders registry, the first of its kind in the country. The electronic register is a comprehensive database containing crucial information on all convicted sex offenders. Judicial officials will have free access to the online registry while members of the public gain access only after making a request. The process requires one to fill the prescribed request form indicating their interest in the information sought to the office of the chief registrar of the judiciary through the e-filing system. The digital tool will not only serve as a discouragement to sexual offenses but will also play a pivotal role in monitoring and supervising convicts following the release from prison. According to the Chief Justice Martha Kome, the implementation of the automated registry is critical in protecting the public against sex offenders. In a city of skyscrapers built on oil and gold, investors have been competing to build the next generation of drones. It began with the very high skyscrapers. Now, the United Arab Emirates wants to exploit the airspace with flying machines too. The United Arab Emirates government predicts the civilian drone industry could be worth as much as 10 billion US dollars by 2025. It's a young and potentially very lucrative market and the UAE is determined to grab a slice of it. The Middle East has long been thought of as an oil region, but the UAE aims to change this with an intense focus on growing the country's technology and startup scene. For the first half of 2022, the Middle East region brought in 1.73 billion US dollars in investments across 354 deals, up from more than 1.2 billion US dollars in the first half of 2021 a 64 year over year growth the drones for good award was also developed by the united arab emirates in order to encourage people to harness drone technology to make people's lives easier the drone for good award is meant to highlight and encourage innovations that can be useful in carrying out complicated and difficult tasks in areas such as firefighting construction, agriculture, and they can even help save our trees and maybe even our planet. The Minister of Cabinet Affairs UAE and also the Chairman of the Organizing Committee of the UAE Drones for Good Award highlights the rationale behind the award, saying it is meant to encourage exploring future technological developments and employing them in the service of humanity. He adds that the overall goal are also to help technology progress in meaningful ways, saying that they hope to enhance the status of the UAE as a global leader in the field of science and technology by adopting the culture of innovation and taking advantage of available technologies to improve human life in several key areas. Ever thought of technology forcing you to do something out of your will in a good way in order to access a service? Well, today we show you a very interesting, almost humorous side of technology. Here goes our Tech of the Week feature.
There are many ways that technology has proven useful, most of which is in the development sector. We sometimes miss the fun ways to use technology to make the world a happier place. Denmark, for instance, has found a way of using AI to force people to smile before they enter the supermarket. This is for everyone, including people with masks on. When at the door, they have to remove it and smile fast before they are granted access. This video has attracted interesting reactions from viewers, with some saying that they need such a door in their homes to only have happy people getting in their spaces. Aside from this type of technology, there has been a buzz in the tech industry around AI and its developments. If you have ever talked with Siri at any given point, whether when searching for a film or show on Netflix or asked Siri about the temperature, then you have interacted with artificial intelligence. AI is a machine that can solve problems that humans perform using natural intelligence. It is used to build agents or robots that can replicate human behavior and decide on humans' behalf. Here are some fun facts about AI. Artificial intelligent pets exist. Well, AI pets are different from real pets that need to be taken care of. AI pets will be robots that look, feel, and act like a real animal but eliminate issues of cleaning and feeding them. It is expected that AI-driven pets will be widely available in the market by 2025. Some AI recognizes emotions. A robot called Kismet can recognize emotions through human body language and voice tone. Another fun fact is that AI has nationalities and passports. Sophia, a lifelike humanoid, has obtained guaranteed citizenship in Saudi Arabia. It has brought controversy as people wonder and question whether or not robots should have rights. AI can also write. A robot wrote an article on an earthquake in California on the Los Angeles Times website gathering data and seismograph. AI will recognize people by voice. The primary purpose of AI is for humans or businesses to have machines that thinks faster and more efficiently. In January 2018, Google CEO Sundar Pichai claimed that AI will be more transformative than electricity. PwC also predicted that the global GDP could rise by 14% as a result of AI-powered activities by 2030 equal to 15.7 trillion US dollars. The opportunities in AI are simply endless. For Tech Talk, we hold down a conversation on digital accessibility for people with disability. Grace Githaga has been joined by a digital accessibility fellow at Kicktonet to take us through this conversation. Let's listen in. Welcome to the interview section of Tech on Tech, a weekly program that brings you technological concepts and debates and breaks them down in an untech way. Now, the issue of accessibility for information, uh, technology, communication has been an issue of discussion for many people. Are we involving everyone? Are we bringing everyone on board? How about persons with disabilities? What are their concerns? Considering that the government has even made it a requirement for everyone to file their taxes online. Now, in today's interview section, we are speaking with Nicodemus Nyakundi. Nicodemus is uh, an accessibility fellow at Kicktonet, and he will be telling us more about a scorecard that they did recently to assess government accessibility for persons with disabilities. My name is Nicodemus Nyakundi. I'm from Kicktonet, that is Kenya ICT Action Network. I am a fellow under digital accessibility, whereby we advocate for accessibility and equality for persons with disability. So we did a scorecard on accessibility of government websites to persons with disabilities. Uh, we wanted to see how persons with disabilities interact with websites. So we figured like government websites are the best place first because they are most accessible put there. So we came up with a scorecard highlighting the challenges that people with disabilities face and the ratings in regard to how better they can be accessed or at what rate 
are they accessible? Uh, from this COCADA, we came to realize that there is a great challenge for persons with disabilities in accessing the websites. Uh, because we depended on what we generally say poor principles, that is, the websites will be perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. So under that, we had indicators whereby we gauged the level of accessible in regard to those indicators. Mm -hmm. And uh, in brief, or in short, uh, I, we came to realize that, like video captions, there are none in the websites. So that was a great concern, given that there are people who can't see. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they can't see, they won't be able to, de de to depict the, what's occurring on the video. And also, we have people who can't hear. If they can't hear, they'll only be seeing pictures on the videos. So they lacked captions. We also had a low level rating in media captions. That's like all text and also in image descriptions. Uh, generally, I'll say that the website had, uh, as a country, we are above average around 60. But there are websites that are below average, which scored around 8.9% of the websites. And then we had uh, others that were beyond 70, which was recommendable. Uh, we came to realize that first was the impact that came with when the government announced that they are going to take services online. So we realized there has been a gap. And if this was to be implemented, then it's going to bring a larger marginalization for persons with disabilities. So we wanted to gauge this accessible, accessibility of these websites so that by then we come to get a clear understanding where we are and inform the next decisions in regard to making these websites accessible. So we employed the international recognized criteria. First was on web content accessibility guidelines, WCAG, and then we relied on World Wide Web, World Wide Web accessibility uh, guidelines because we realized that this are the key indicators that each and every person, and they are universal in nature. Every, anyone can be a gate in regard to those indicators. So that's why we derived it into what I mentioned earlier, the poor principles, whereby we came then below them, came up with indicators like alt text, media captions, and so forth. Um, the key findings was the rates of government websites. Uh, allow me to mention, for example, the e-citizen. Uh, we realized that most of the services were not accessible to persons with disabilities. But then you find that this is a major platform whereby, like uh, in, a few day, in a few days ago, the government put in more services on it, around 5,000. So you'll find that if they are not accessible, then uh, most persons with disability are let out into accessing the services. So, and then there was an, an issue with the National Transport Authority website, whereby all information could not reach persons with disability because of poor accessibility. So, under such, uh, those are regard that should be taken into consideration, and then they should be implemented. Uh, if I add on, uh, we had a good example from the National Council for Persons with Disabilities websites. Uh, it scored uh, above 80%, and uh, it can be a good benchmark for other websites to copy and look into so that they are able to also self-gauge. Takes a short break. In today's interview section, we are speaking with Nicodemus Nyakundi, who is an ICT Accessibility Fellow at Kicktonet, and is talking to us about a scorecard they did recently to assess government websites and how accessible they are for persons with disabilities. Please continue following us on our social media handles and that's at KBC Channel One. Welcome back to the interview section of Tech on Tech. We are discussing the issue of government uh, websites and how accessible they are for persons with disability with Nicodemus Nyakundi, who is an accessibility fellow at Kicktonet. So the first barrier is what this scorecard was trying to address, which is access to information. That's a great barrier. Uh, generally, we'll say that you won't say that if your website is 80% accessible, 
and the information that reaching a person with disability is 80%, that's similar to like no information at all because uh, information should come full uh, because it should be, let me say, enveloped in a full capacity. So you get to understand the full content of information. Uh, another thing that we came to realize that person of disabilities are not involved in development of websites or digital platforms. So that is another barrier because people do that without the input of person with disabilities. They don't get to understand the experience that person with disabilities do or face while accessing these websites. As such, we tend to realize that they are bringing what we call a more marginalization to the digital platforms. Uh, another barrier that uh, usually comes in on ICT is the issue of digital literacy. And uh, in that, you find that uh, not all persons with disabilities are informed on using these ICT services. Uh, for example, the e-citizen, yes, there are programs there, there are services that the government is offering to its citizens. Um, you realize that uh, people with disabilities are not included in digital literacy programs. And if they are, then the digital literacy programs are not inclusive in terms of uh, reaching out to them. So you find that they are left out and uh, they miss a lot in these services. And uh, then the sack of poverty, the sack of uh, dependency will continue. The biggest or the foremost recommendation is bring persons with disability on board, get them involved, get to hear their lived experience. Uh, the other recommendation that we give is that the developers of websites and the digital platforms, let them be made aware that there's need for accessibility. Uh, it's not a, a request, it's a necessity that should be there. And also, we have to look into the policies. I know there is a standard on implementation of accessibility websites like the Kenya Standard 2952, but then you realize it's not implemented. So who are the watchdogs? Uh, we recommend that councils like the National Council for Persons with Disabilities together with the Ministry of ICT, they can collaborate in ensuring that there is someone watching over the implementation of these rules and the policies. Uh, I'll say that uh, when we develop this scorecard, uh, it's just the beginning. There's a lot more. We only did 47 websites. There are more that was uncovered. That we have counted around 42 counties that were not covered. We have other digital platforms, and also there's more apps in the country, like the digital uh, cabs and so forth. So you find that if persons with disabilities are not able to use these digital platforms, they are being left out. So it is a call that there is a need to support this program in assessing more digital platform for persons with disabilities so that it is an inclusive ecosystem. That's it from our interview section of Tech on Tech, where we discussed accessibility of government websites for persons with disabilities with Nicodemus Myakundi from Kicktonet. And until next week, my name is Grace Gidaiga. Keep watching. It is now time for a little bit of creativity and innovation. Did you try out the last challenge we gave you? If so, how did that go? If not, well, today we have a special DIY just for you, which you can try at home and then give us a feedback at KUBC Channel 1 using the hashtag Take on Tech. Let's check out today's challenge.
you for your company. This is now where we draw the curtains on today's show. But don't worry, the conversation still continues. We are asking you, what more needs to be done to help promote digital accessibility for people with disabilities? Talk to us. The hashtag to use is take on tech at KBC Channel 1. My personal handle is at Stephanie Ayeta across all social media platforms. Let's meet next week, same time, same place. Until then, let's give it tech. Adios.